these guys are not really Johnny-come-latelys to the internet scene. Back in the old days, back in ancient history, back in, oh, say, the 1970s, um, phony invoice schemes were pretty common. Um, they started off with uh, telex directories. Now, I really can't say I have a claim to fame of being a telex hacker back in the days because in those days, telex had no fame. Telex was just a business-to-business -business teletype network that nobody really played with. But I was offered computer time on an HP 2000C time-sharing system out at the State University of New York at Brockport, 20 miles outside of Rochester, my hometown. I could either take the Greyhound bus out there or find a computer terminal with a dial-up modem and dial into the thing. But we're talking the 1970s here. Um, terminals with modems were not that common in those days. But I'm walking past this office one day, and there's a Model 33 teletype with a dial on it. Twix machine? Scratch, scratch, scratch. What's a Twix machine? Well, TWX stood for Teletype Writer Exchange. Um, now, Telex itself is a five-level Bordeaux system, while the Twix network, which was owned by AT&T, uh, was a seven-level ASCII, actually 8-bit with parity, uh, using Model 33 teletypes. Uh, Telex originally uh, came from Europe. Uh, there was a cable that went from um, Land's End in England to uh, Newfoundland in Canada. It was brought across. Western Union snaked a line down from Montreal, started things off in New York, and, and expanded across the country. Um, AT&T saw this uh, business to business communications market and said, hey, we want some of this action. Um, their, uh, the Teletype Corporation was formed to manufacture teletype equipment. It was 50% owned by Western Electric and the other 50% owned by AT&T. So it was basically all owned by AT&T. Uh, um, in those days, Western Union would publish a telex directory. The big international firm was Jaeger Waldemann of Germany for the worldwide telex directory. That was a really good book. But these scam artists would get a hold of these directories and send out phony invoices for their own telex directory. And, uh, you know, usually just, if it goes to a large enough company, it goes to the accounting department, oh, a directory. Well, I guess we need to just pay this bill. And the scammers would get away with it uh, in many cases. You know, they'd send out hundreds of invoices, get maybe 10 replies, but because they were charging so much, it made the mailing worth it to them anyway. Um, these days, when I go to look back for something like that, all I can find are links that refer to phony advertising solicitations, which uh, start off with bogus yellow pages bills, that I'm sure still goes on. And under phony fax directory schemes, we find that they list telefax and telex uh, directories as, um, you know, some of these fraudulent directories that are being billed for and to watch out for. Um, by the way, I'm doing my links from my website at cheshirecatalyst.com slash domain.html. Uh, it's just a thrown together web page. PowerPoint, I find, is the greatest thing to help sleep since Somonex. And um, besides, it's a Microsoft product. So I tend to simply write web pages, throw them up, uh, blow them up on uh, the screen to, uh, to show as um, my notes, and then I just put the web page up on my website if you want to get to these notes uh, later and uh, follow the links. Um, out in Australia, there is a telex warning on Scamwatch, scamwatch.gov.au, about directories and advertising, false billing, and uh, you know where to report them if you're an Aussie and things like that. Warning signs, they'll receive a call from a business director or other publication you've never heard of, blah, blah, blah. And this is how the, uh, the telex schemes used to work. Well, the fax machines and email kind of killed off telex. Um, AT&T sold the Twix network to Western Union uh, back in the late 70s. And in fact, um, the combined telex director, the first one in 1973, uh, I, I was looking through the directory, which of course it's public information, so I picked one up. 
But because it was AT&T, their directories were in their standard telephone kind of format. You'd have a state, within each state you'd have cities, and within those cities you'd have the listing for that city. Western Union just lumped the whole state together, because it was business to business, and the, you know, people from all over the state would be doing business with each other. But AT&T still had their standards from the phone side of the house, so they did it that way. I'm looking through the telex directory for the state of Virginia one day, the Twix directory rather, the AT&T side, and I notice a little town with an unusual name. And there's only one listing in the name, and it's the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Now, I could just imagine the scene as the guys at this office are getting their Twix machine, and they're filling out the forms, and it says, what's your company name? Oh, well, we're the U.S. Department of Agriculture. <laughs> U.S. Department of Agriculture. City, oh, we can't tell you that. It's classified. And there, listed as classified Virginia, is the U.S. Department of Agriculture. <laughs> so you can just imagine who actually operated that Twix teletype machine. It just says paranoia has always been here. <laughs> so uh, paranoia strikes deep, yes. Um, so basically these kinds of scams have been around a while. They just adapt themselves. And so now they're adapting to the internet age where we have the um, domain name expiration notice that goes out. Oops, excuse me. And uh, you can see from the billing cycle here, it's uh, $30 for one year, $60 for two years, etc. cetera. Um, they're really trying to scam you well, I'm sure. Uh, I know my registrar is a lot cheaper than that. And um, so that's out there. Um, under domain names, you'll find people warning you against this outfit. Um, domain Registry of America scam is listed here under uh, UCAN, which is the Utility Consumers Action Network out of San Diego. Um, they've got all sorts of information about it, warning people about this sort of thing. Um, it's not new. Wikipedia itself has a listing. And it's interesting because it says, this article has been nominated to be checked for its neutrality. I mean, if you're talking about a scammer, you may not be neutral uh, in, in your discussion of the scammer. Uh, this article may be inaccurate uh, in or unbalanced towards certain viewpoints. I mean, people don't like this guy. So uh, it, it may reflect that in the uh, Wikipedia listing, so you should be warned about that. Um, and it's got the usual external links to Federal Trade Commission versus the Main Registry of America. Um, you know, all sorts of things that uh, you might want to look up. So you can follow this link from my page and, and get there and see all that. The PERP, this is their website, Domain Registry of America. Um, and an interesting touch, you'll notice that the fave icon does show a pseudo-American flag. <laughs> and yet, if we look back in the Wikipedia listing, just to be sure, we'll see that um, web hosting service originally based in the Canadian province of Ontario, uh, now reportedly based in Buffalo, New York. Uh, and uh, let's see. So of course, they now show um, North America out of Buffalo, UK in London, and Australia, New Zealand out of Melbourne, Australia. Um, looks like an ordinary enough website. Oh, and look, they'll take MasterCard, Visa, or an American Express. So uh, the banks don't care how the money comes in, of course. Uh, you can register your domain, renew your name, all that stuff. But just, when this stuff comes in the mail, take a look at it. If it's not from your registrar, it's probably one of these guys trying to get you switched over to them as a registrar, and that's what uh, these things are doing. Um, they have misleading text, but if you read them closely, uh, it says exactly that you don't have to pay this, this is not an invoice. So many people do not read things closely. <laughs> um, I mean, people here are a little more skeptical than others when, when things come in like this, but really, you really do need to watch this sort of thing and be careful that you're not taken in. Um, I had meant this to be an interactive discussion because I figured there might be some interesting scams folks out in the audience know about um, and had hoped to uh, have a microphone out there. How about, how about just outright the main fact, which has happened to me? Ah, 
Would you care to come up and discuss the domain theft that has happened to you? Well, I, um, we need to get in the microphone. Now it's a matter of record. Now it's a matter of record. Yes. Uh -huh. I've, uh, I've had a number of domains. It started off with uh, some of the earlier registrars, but then all of a sudden I found myself having my domain sucked out from under me to a new registrar and started paying me for money. This is before I ended up just transferring everything to GoDaddy some years ago. Um, and of course, they, tra they charged me a transfer fee. They charged me a renewal fee that was like three times what it should have been. And I had a hell of a time proving that I did not authorize the transfer and because they kept denying it. Uh, it took me like six months to straighten this out, and I got upset. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure upset is not the word, but... Um. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Uh, I know that uh, ICANN receives a bunch of complaints about certain registrars like that uh, who had just uh, out and out stolen uh, registration on domains. And uh, yeah, in the back. And uh, please, if you'd care to come up and sure. into the microphone. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to point out to a lot of people looking to register domains that some uh, domain checking if a domain is registered is actually a scam. So if you check, type in www.thisismydomain.com into their checker, they actually register that domain while you check for it and then attempt to resell it to you at a higher price. So be very wary of whom you're checking if a domain is registered with before you purchase it. Try and go through popular official channels just to make sure you're safe. I've noticed that sort of thing myself where I will just try a domain name to see if it's available and two days later it's no longer available. So what I've gotten used to doing now is logging into my registrar and using their who is. Um, Who's your actually I'm using GoDaddy and um, I figure once I'm logged in I'm on HTTPS for secure. Uh, you know people can't watch over my shoulder to see what domain names I'm checking out. And I'll, you know, try two or three before I settle on, on ones I really like. Um, yeah, for example, uh, one of the things I'm doing these days, oh, yeah, the amateur radio stations are starting to come on now. Let's see. Uh, phonefriendly.com is uh, one of my new domains. What I'm starting to do is uh, writing web pages for mobile phone browsers. Uh, those of my fans who may recall in past years I've spoken about web accessibility and making web pages accessible to all browsers. I've finally stopped beating my head against the wall with Flash. I've just given up and started simply writing pages for smaller web browsers that can't handle Flash. Uh, right now Apple is my hero for uh, leaving Flash off of the iPhone and iPad because it really just sucks bandwidth. Um, for eye candy that real, mostly contains no content. Where you're using it for instructional purposes, that's good. But for just advertising websites, it's, it's just ridiculous to waste people's time, particularly on low bandwidth devices. Uh, there are still some people out there with dial-up. Heck, there's still people out there with web TV. Uh, there's no reason that, if you want the, the business from these people, then your website has to be accessible to them. Uh, interesting thing about um, my phone-friendly website, you'll notice numbered links here. If you're uh, going to phonefriendly.com or ph2.mobi, um, so it's a little easier on your thumbs, uh, you can just press these numbers on your telephone dial and they will jump to these particular uh, web pages. Now, you'll notice at the bottom I have uh, the asterisk goes to about phone-friendly and zero will call my number. Uh, the pound key doesn't seem to be in use. What happens if we press the pound key? What? You expect an Easter egg for finding the pound key? <laughs> so uh, I do have my fun on occasion. And uh, you know, for your trouble, I will give you access to my humor directory. And uh, you know, a bunch of old text files and fun things out there for you to look at and have fun with. So um, you know, I'm, I'm still one of those people who thinks the internet is uh, for fun and for uh, sharing information with. Um, you know, but it's scammers like these guys at uh, the main registry of America and, and others that are just, so. yes? So, um, uh, back in the 80s, there was a... Okay. Long story. Uh, 
Yeah, back in the old days, um, there was a similar phony invoice scam um, that was centered around um, business uh, business registries and listings. I don't know if you, anyone recalls a thing called the Thomas Register. Oh yes. It used to be this encyclopedia of businesses, and to to advertise or have your company in that register cost quite a bit of money, a few hundred dollars a year. So of course there were scammers like this that would say, oh, you know, uh, you know, uh, list your company in, uh, you know, our our registry or something. And a lot of times these invoices would come for six hundred dollars and they would just get paid out. And uh, and actually that's a scam that still persists to this day. I still see these invoices coming. You know, it's, it's more related to like search engines, like you know, be listed on our search engine. You know, here, here's an invoice for six hundred dollars, and the fine print says you don't have to pay it, but. Uh, you know, to your point about a lot of people still being on dial-up, a lot of people, you know, from they haven't caught on that these are that these are scams. So they just they just pay these. I sometimes get these invoices from the accounting department. Like, should I pay this? You know, what what is this about? So, so you know, this kind of uh, scam still exists. Yes. And I've got the bright lights in my face. I cannot see hands over here. So just come on up. I'll just do this so I can face okay. the audience. He has a couple other things I've seen, and I've got a number of domains, and one of the things is an organization out of Hong Kong that will send you emails saying, I see that you have something.net or .org registered, and you need to protect your identity, and so we can get you the .com for only $99. You ought to act right now. And they say, like, we own it, and like we would like to sell it to you for $99. The reality is, as you said, if you go through your own registrar, HTTPS, they don't own anything. However, as soon as you express any interest with them, they're going to snag it. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that some of these registries <coughs> have been snagging domains and kind of kiting them, kind of like E.F. Hutton did. And so you can, you've got something like 72 hours to get the money to ICANN. If it doesn't go, they drop it. But then they had a couple of these set up where they had been kiting millions of domain names. Basically, any type of search engine, or if you go into some of the things that would allow you to say, hey, what terms have been searched for, they say, hey, wow, someone searching for this will go ahead and start kiting it around. And if you say that you want it, the game stops, they lock it down, 99 bucks, 199, whatever it is that you want to do. Probably one of the most audacious ones that I've seen involves a paper invoice, which is not an invoice. And it comes from the UK. And I get this about every six months, and it's a $2,995 invoice for 12 special reports. And it's sent to me at a special address that I only use for my domain registration, so I happen to know where I could trace it back. And uh, I can see that if the company were a little bit bigger, as compared to some of us uh, small entrepreneurs, it might just go right into the accounts payable, blah, 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 and the guy gets it. Now, he specifically says at the bottom that technically this is not an invoice. But if you're over 50 years old, you can't read it. It's in presbyopic font, you know, about four point. And so I can see how it, you figure, okay, what's the, what's the postage for mailing that stuff? Yeah, it's not 41 cents. Actually, it comes from the U.S., but it's return address from, mm -hmm. from the U.K. So it costs you 44 cents, maybe 50 cents. Well, how many hits do you need at 3,000 bucks to make a 50 cent scam work? And so you find out very much like spam, this thing scales pretty well. And uh, you just got to be careful about that. Um, so anyway, I use the same registrar in general as you do, mm -hmm. uh, the GoDaddy, it's HTTPS, and uh, well, you know, once you lock things in there, it's pretty good, and uh, you can protect your investment and protect your wallet from somebody else basically trying to catch you on a slow day. Can I, can I have two suggestions for that? Sure. Uh, the first one is when you get those envelopes, if they're prepaid, stick other junk mail in and send it back to them so they get charged for it. Yeah, that was Abby Hoffman steal this book. Yeah. We remember that oh, from, yes. the, from the 60s and <laughs> 70s, which basically said if you go to big corporations, take that business reply mail and glue it to a brick. <laughs> and then let them pay the postage back. And the other yeah. one is if you're not interested in the domain names, go show interest in them. So, but again, they're going to kite. If they buy them up. If they buy them up. But again, they've been kiting them, which means they don't put any real money out. Because all you need to have is two domain registrars. And then as soon as this one's about ready to let go, the next one picks it up. And you pick it up and you pick it up. And this thing just flies around the internet. And, uh, you know, it's interesting to get a little bit more sophisticated. I remember back in the late 90s, I actually had a one-letter domain registered because it had client-side verification on the minimum of three characters. Well, not to say that client-side verification isn't a good idea, but you could get a one-character domain. The problem is, and the registrar upped their price because it was a foreign nation to 199 bucks a year. And it really wasn't worth 199 bucks a year to have a, you know, you know one-character dot something-something domain. Although today now with all the little text messages, that'd be an, a great URL shortener. Mm -hmm.
But an idea too far ahead of its time is not worth the money. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, um, Let's see. We've got the. Uh, any other stories from the audience? I just had a question. Oh, yes. I was just like, uh, my impression from hearing these stories is that it's pretty much a scam that, you can, that these companies can run and face pretty much no legal consequences whatsoever. I mean, you set up the FTC. FTC yeah, because jail. somewhere in the... Uh, well, somewhere in the uh, the letter you get, or the email you get, or the notice you get, there is something that says that it is a solicitation only and not an invoice, and that protects them legally. So, uh, yes, uh, they are protected, as it were, from uh, being brought down upon by the FTC, Federal Trade Commission, and other such agencies. Yes. <coughs> uh, this is kind of a related domain name scam. Uh, a friend of mine is actually still doing this he will send a spam letter to an owner of a domain offering to buy it for some large sum of money, but he wants to have it appraised first. And he'll trust a third-party domain appraiser. That's the scam. You pay the domain name appraiser $500 to figure out the value. And by, that, by, the, point, by the time you've paid them, um, well, the initial offer kind of goes away. Interesting. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, um, I wanted to uh, let it be known. Um, lots of people have asked me about back issues of uh, TAP and uh, you know, the old newsletter I used to help publish. Um, and a few years back, I had a little CD-ROM with my little book on it. And I've combined that into one disc right now for $30, which I will have uh, available here uh, at the conference. Uh, just see me after the talk. Uh, is this a domain scam? This is not a domain <laughs> scam, no. Uh, it's uh, a CD of all the back issues of TAP imaged onto the CD, uh, plus my little book. Uh, you'll find a directory in here marked e-reader, so um, if you want to put it on your mobile phone, if it's a, a smartphone that can handle e-reader software. Uh, I've got e-reader software for Windows and Mac on here, plus the PDB file that is the book, and a link out to ereader.com where you can get the software for uh, whatever mobile device you've got that they've got the software for. Um, so please see me after the, uh, the talk about that. Uh, with that, I've pretty much run out of things to say on this and uh, won't waste your time on that. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, um, for those of you who do know me, I'm about to tell the 321 story again. Um, so it, it's a, if you want to look up, that's fine. But I, I, I keep hearing people who don't know the story, who want to hear the story. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm going to, um, my, when I come to these conferences, of course, I'm resting on my laurels from uh, the 70s and 80s with the TAP newsletter. And, uh, but at the late 90s, uh, my new claim to fame is that they were splitting the 407 area code around Orlando, Florida, East Central Florida. That's an area that covered the Kennedy Space Center, uh, an area known as the Space Coast of Florida, which is where I was living for 20 years. Um, well, being an old phone freak, um, I decided to look into this uh, public hearing that was coming up, and I went out to a website I knew about, NANPA, the North American Government Plan Administration, and I started going down the list. Now, your phone freaks here, you know the list. 201 New Jersey, 202 DC, blah, 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 etc. And gaps marked available for geographic relief. Well, I'm going down the list and I see this number 321. 32, why does that ring a bell? Oh, yeah, uh, my addition to the Tom Lehrer song. Little Johnny Jones, he was a U.S. pilot, and no shrinking violet was he. 321, he was mighty proud when World War III was the court. Well, you know, it's, it's the countdown, the 321. Countdown, wait a minute. I'm living here in the countdown capital of the world. Hey, I think it would be cool if the countdown capital of the world had 321 as an area code. Well, it's time for me to bring down the web browser, bring up the word processor, and to begin preparing my, uh, my testimony for the Public Service Commission hearing. See, back in uh, the 80s, when 718 was split from 212, I went to that Public Service Commission hearing and learned a few valuable lessons because 
you know, all the little old ladies, you know, and, and, and the seniors, uh, setters, and everybody was there deploring the extra digits they'd have to dial and this, that, and the other. And I was the only person at that Public Service Commission hearing when they split 718 who said yes, of course. It's a technical uh, requirement that they're running out of uh, numbers in the 212 area code. Give it to them by all means. However, in return, why not remove the $1 per month touch tone fee so that people could get touch tone on their phones and it would be easier to dial the extra digits? Oh, well, uh, blah, 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 this is not a rate case. And um, I started hanging around and I actually went to a rate case and um, discussed the matter there. Uh, it was most interesting. Uh, the uh, phone people just really hated to see me. It was wonderful. Uh, but getting back to Florida, uh, having this experience, I knew enough to print out copies of my testimony for each of the commissioners and one extra copy for the transcriptionist. If you really want to make friends with somebody who counts, make sure you've got that extra copy for the transcriptionist because nobody ever gives them a copy. <laughs> So um, I went in, I made my little presentation, you know, that not only should uh, 321 be for the Space Coast of Florida, but here's a printout from the North American Numbering Plan Administration showing it's available. So the way I like to look at it is, I asked for it, they approved it, so it must be my area code, but I share. However, I did save the best number for myself. And you can reach my cell phone by dialing three, two, one, liftoff. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> now, now that took a little bit of doing. Um, uh, I ran down to the kiosk at the mall and went up to the lady from Bell South Mobility and said, hi, uh, I've dialed the number. And uh, I got the recording saying, the number you have reached at Bell South Mobility is not currently in service at this time. And, and the, I'd like the number 5438633, please. Well, she dials her boys in Melbourne, uh, Melbourne, Florida. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. Terribly sorry, but the boys in Melbourne tell me that that number is unavailable, totally unavailable. It's in the middle of a, a hundred group that's on a corporate rate. Oh, okay. So, dejected, I go home and I power up the web browser. Bellsawmobility.com. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Oh, about the company. All right. Uh-huh. Very good. I could use some of that information. Ah, okay. Mark Fiedler is the president of the company at this time. Good to know. But I don't have his email address. Boy, isn't that a shame. Oh, oh. Press room. Okay. Let's go look at the press room. And here's a J. Random uh, uh, press release. And I'll look that up. And, and, and Oh. And there's an email address of a publicity flag. First name underscore last name at. Uh-huh. It's time to bring down the web browser and bring up the email. Mark underscore Fiedler at Dear Mr. Fiedler. <laughs> and I explained, you know, uh, what the Public Service Commission hearing, 321, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I asked for it. They approved it. It's my area code. Uh, may I please have 5438633? So that as of November 1st, 1999, my phone number will be 321 liftoff. Send. Oh, darn. And as I hit the send button and look at my watch, it's 6.30 p.m. on a Friday. I can't possibly hear from this guy till what? Probably Monday, maybe Tuesday. Sunday. You have new mail. Cool. And I bring it up. Sure, I'll get my people on it. <laughs> and the rest, as they say, is history. <laughs> so, uh, a, a good hack if I do say so myself. And, and much fun. So that's uh, the kind of fun I have with this sort of thing. And um, I thank you all for coming at this hour. <laughs> Any other questions or anything else? Okay, thanks. I just think you should have played with the telex story. Oh, well, the there telex. Some interesting things on there. Yeah. Um, telex I had much fun with back in the day. Um, I wound up being able to reach any telex machine in the world uh, through the Western Union InfoMaster computer. Well, I could reach anyone outside because they all had New York City uh, Twix numbers that would do the speed and code conversion. Um, I couldn't reach telex machines in the U.S. 
until I found the Twix number for Western Union InfoMaster. Yeah. I'm trying to remember. I lived in, uh, well, I lived in Switzerland. System available for mm -hmm. like 300 blog connections. Yeah. And uh, I started to play around with it, and you know, it turns out it was all free. I didn't, I didn't, oh, wow. I didn't figure out how they ever charged for anything. And then eventually Based I. Based on the Minitel or something? No, it wasn't Minitel. In Switzerland, so Minitel was France. They didn't yeah, have that. Right. In Switzerland, they, have some, they had something called Videotex, but it was all great. Oh, yeah. expensive. Huh. And I never, I mean, like my parents couldn't afford it, so I never I, I never had the chance to play the video. Yeah. And, um, so